with the with the levels of institutions, the family schools, all sorts of institutions, and right down to the intimate level of people's relationships, one with with another. Okay, of course, uh, we cannot ask to all of you to present yourselves, but it's nice to see that there is a chat. So if you want to say something, please write there so we can give a look at least about the audience. I see some friends there, but also a lot of names that I don't know, which is uh, very bad. But I hope that we will have time to, to have a conversation later, maybe. So let's go on. Let's start to talk about the book. Uh, we started three years ago, I would say, by I would say I would say we went 13 years ago. Laura. Yeah, well, 26 years ago. Okay, but <laughs> for the book, the idea came from a debate in Europe about um, transformative learning and the, the fact that in Europe it is not a dominant theory as it is in the US but we had a conference in Berlin in 2014 where a panel was created and then from that panel there was a, a new European group so I don't you know I don't want to make all the story but there is some reasons for uh, the difficulty of this theory to become mainstream in uh, in some of the European countries so we became curious about uh, what is there what is the possibility for us to take this word transformation and start a dialogue and maybe try to co complexify it a little bit, see it in another perspective. And all of a sudden we realized that even our perspectives were very different. So we started to write and to talk about this idea of transformation. Minder, transformation yeah, um, is yours. I mean, I. I you see on the on the PowerPoint, it says a troubled world. I, I, I don't want to go into that a great deal. We'll all have our different takes on it in ecological crisis. Um, liquid worlds in which it's difficult to stand still. Th those sorts of things are certainly around for, for, for me. I think what became um, clear as, as a metaphor in terms of what we were doing was it was becoming a pilgrimage. And I, I quite like the idea of pilgrimage, and I know it's worked for colleagues in the States. Um, and one of the people we, we meet on this particular pilgrimage and pause, um, take a look at the view, um, have a dialogue together, um, talk about what, what we think transformation might be about or what transformative learning is about one of the people was 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 libby tisdall um you'll see there there's the sign of pilgrimage on the left hand side of the um powerpoint that's the medieval sign of pilgrimage the coquille de saint jacques um the yellow thing there i, I of course live now in a city of pilgrimage uh, canterbury and if you don't know very much about canterbury probably you at least know about Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. I, I think what happened was that um, the pace of walking was helpful. And sometimes we'd walk in the village where Lara lives near Milan and just talk about some of these issues. And then we'd introduce various people who we felt could help us uh, to make sense of what on earth we might mean by transformation or transformative learning. Jack Meserau, obviously, and, and his ideas of perspective transformation. People like Bauman, Zygmunt Bauman, who has written illuminatingly, I think, about the problems of what he calls liquid modernity, where nothing stays the same and everything is in, is in, is in flux, uh, and what that might do to us as, as individuals and communities. I, I went back to, to Freud, and Laura and I had a difficult conversation. Jung, I think, is probably better known in this in, the, in this context. Sabina Spielrein um, was someone who's very influential. Some of you might have seen the movie A Dangerous Method with Kira Knightley. Uh, Spielrein actually was his lover for a time, a source of great con con controversy. Um, Spielrein introduced Jung, not the other way around, to the idea of the instinct 
the transformation. That's an idea we might pick up later. Uh, Dante was somebody else. <laughs> Laura is Italian and knows this better than I, but that, that, that kind of journeying um, from hell to a celestial city, I don't know, touched on certain things we felt might be important and so on. And Gregory Bateson is a, great, is a big, is a big uh, source of insight for, for, for Lara. And then there are other people which we'll move on to in, in due course. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add that this idea of the pilgrimage is also a way to make friendship with the, the, with the authors. Uh, try to write in a way that is a dialogue with these authors. Um, normally, academic writing is very, in a way, it's very detached. Uh, you need to be very rational, objective, make uh, a good analysis of texts, uh, which is, of course, very important. But um, there is also another way which is more embodied, more uh, also effective to, to dialogue with these authors. And one of the um, aspects that I like a lot in working with Linden is that uh, Linden is always very attentive to the biographies of people. So you don't only need to know what people wrote, but wh what was their life. This is very, uh, very important for adult education because uh, we are not the products. We are uh, uh, the life, the, uh, the embodied life of people. So in the book, we have a lot of perspectives. And by the way, I want to... Um, to highlight that the word perspective so comes from uh, Italy and it was invented by an Italian. The perspective, in fact, is, is a way to draw, it's a way to represent reality. And in the Renaissance uh, in Florence, uh, they created this uh, technique, which is very, in a way, very scientific, very rational. You can use uh, numbers, measure, to be very precise when you reproduce the word. But of course, uh, you can have different kinds of perspectives. In many in other cultures that have different roots, uh, there are not uh, straight lines. People don't have the idea of perspective as we have it in the Western uh, culture. So it's very interesting to um, explore the meaning of this word. And in the book, we tried to show that uh, if you look at reality from different perspectives, you see things, but you don't see other things. So every perspective has its limits. And here you see a list of some of the perspectives that we have uh, in the book, not all of them, uh, because of course there is much more, but um, we like the idea to share with you some of, the, of these topics. Uh, Linden already mentioned uh, Mezirov, and Mezirov knew uh, Bateson's work. I was trained in a systemic uh, family therapy, but for me, the systemic perspective is a way to, to live, is a way to stay in the world, to interpret what's going on in my life with my children, with my family, with my students. So it's not only something that I use to make research or to uh, write <laughs> papers to be published. Uh, so the systemic perspective for me is a way to see that reality is very complex and uh, we must be very humble because we are so inside the reality that we only see a very little part of the big circle. We only see the, the part of the arc of the circle that our perspective allows us. So dialogue becomes necessary because I need the other to understand that my perspective is, is limited. We need, we need the other. And more the other is different from us, more lucky we are, which is a big problem in the present times because otherness is uh, the big problem of the moment. But uh, we will talk about that maybe later. Linda, do you want to talk about that psychology and the spiritual and religious uh, thing? I think we, we, we move on to it in a minute. I think the, the, the processes of dialogue between us were also um, difficult, uh, as they almost always are uh, with, with adults um, and children, I guess, and young people. Um, I mean, I felt as though um, at times I was so profoundly ignorant. And that that can be scary. I mean, you, 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 were, you were trained in the 
systemic um, tradition. I think you also had a sense of the importance of the aesthetic in a life, um, what we might call the search for beautiful things, um, the place of love, uh, the place of art, and making things more than they actually are, a kind of something above and beyond the pieces, the whole is much greater than some of the parts. I think you you had that perspective, which I, which I, yes, I kind of knew of in a, in a vague way, but um, I think I found it very challenging. And of course, I think one of the great issues in um, adult education, maybe in notions of transformation, is when we encounter things that are difficult, maybe a bit frightening. Maybe we feel that they're going to challenge us right to the core. Maybe we feel it deeply in our body. I don't want to know this. I don't want anything to do with it. So there were aspects of that, I think, in our pilgrimage. Yeah, that, uh, that uh, for me was uh, the big problem, one of the big problems. Uh, there were many moments when I was so upset with you. One <laughs> was when you obliged me to read Bauman's, uh, Bauman's uh, writing about Bateson, which was critical and I didn't accept it. But then the most difficult was uh, the spiritual thing because uh, in our dialogue, you were the spiritual person. I was the mat very materialist one. So when you say, yes, I like beauty, but I look beauty in its, uh, in its uh, you know, performance, while mm -hmm. you look at the spiritual aspect of it. Uh, and that's really, for me, it was uh, a lot of learning. I'm still learning, by the way. Me too. Yeah. I, I think with the spiritual, it's easy to talk about that in, well, relatively easy uh, in in contexts of adult education uh, and i was also struggling whether almost a bit of coming out whether i could talk about the religious as well because that carries so much um so much baggage but that was part of my own pilgrimage that i very much wanted to bring into the conversation talking about transformation but i still feel slightly ambivalent ab ab about that but although i found some provisional resolution in, in, in the idea of um, the divine or the numinous in the material and in the everyday world, including in the adult education classroom. And the tr trouble is sometimes we don't notice it. And I think that impoverishes our understanding of things. Shall we move on to? Yeah, well, I would like to say something. Well, we can move on because this uh, is uh, going to come back later. Yep. Uh, yeah, we, we go to the, me the methodology. How did we create the book? How did we work together? The um, first inspiration cr came from uh, these metalogues. I don't know if our audience knows about uh, Bateson's work, but uh, if you read his books, there is uh, always a part uh, uh, of metalogues, which is a uh, invented but not really invented sometimes they seem very real dialogues between a father and a daughter and these dialogues are uh, philosophical in a way because they reflect on the meaning of uh, processes of things that they observe in the world out there and uh, the metalogue is a sort of metaphoric dialogue because it's not very important what they say but how they say it. Uh, so the, the flux of the conversation becomes very interesting. It's a way for Bateson to think in a narrative way. He, he has a, a motto that is think by stories. Use stories to understand where you are, who you are, what you are doing. So we started to use writing in a dialogic way to search around our way of seeing, our perspectives. The question here is how can we talk to each other in order to develop ideas or in order to see things that we are not able to see in a way. And uh, as we said at the start, difference is the very important thing. Mm, for Bateson, difference is uh, the basis of every information, every learning, every knowledge starts from a difference that becomes a process of more difference Difference uh, nurtures differences, and differences create ideas and new information. So learning uh, needs this difference. If you are in a very 
complete uh, situation where you have no differences at all, everybody thinks the same, there is no learning, and it's death. It's really the death of knowledge and of uh, culture. So difference uh, between two people is biographical. It, it has to do with the culture they come from. Uh, it's a different of uh, perspectives. And uh, when you look at an object, we don't see the same object. So do you remember in the, we were in Tacoma the first time for the conference of um, transformative yeah. learning and we were in a, in a room and we started the first metalogue by looking mm. at this uh, image. Wow, yeah. Um, I, I still feel some of the responses. Um, Bateson liked stories. Um, actually, so did Freud. Um, and maybe those are pretty fundamental in terms of our efforts to make sense of human experience and not to close down on the complexity of stories. And, and to live with some humility in relation to people and their complexities. This, this is a story um, about me many years ago. And um, I think it was the first time I was in Rome. This is La Pieta, of course, by Michelangelo. And I remember it was in the days before there was any great security around this. I don't know how many people who are here tonight, today, this morning, this afternoon, um, know, know this or have been to, to Rome, to St. Peter's, but um, I wandered into the, into the Basilica and uh, at th those times there, there wasn't a security screen around it. It was there just to be walked up to and, and almost touched. Um, and I was overwhelmed. I didn't know it was by Michelangelo and um, it brought tears to my eyes and I, I sat, I contemplated, I may, may have even, you know, cried a bit, I don't know, this just struck me as um, the divine, a divine creation. Um, afterwards, I, I, after I'd walked around the rest of the basilica, I, I, there's a street opposite St. Peter's, I've forgotten the via, what, via something, it goes, goes out of my mind. And I came to a little card shop and there were cards on sale. And it was only then when I picked up a card with the La Pieta on, I realized that this was by Michelangelo and I cried again. Um, and then zooming forward, or yeah, forward in, in relatively recently in 2017, we were asked in a conference to describe a moment where we, we had a glimpse, if you like, of the numinous or, or the divine. And I described this experience in, in, in a group. And um, yeah, I sat back and thought there might be silence and um, a reflexive quality to the comments. And somebody, somebody said something like, well, that's patriarchal nonsense. That's a man's view of, of women. And I, I was absolutely astonished and, and quite, quite bothered, quite disturbed by it. And I couldn't find a way of... Um, really responding adequately. I, I think the space closed down, there was a, a sense of disconnection in, in, in the room and it was a little bit after that that Lara and I were able to to talk about this and about the experience and I, I think sometimes the, the diabolical in human experience yeah. takes, takes place, place. Where, when somebody challenges what for somebody else is, the sake, is something sacred. Or, or, or divine. So this struck us, I think, as a, as a, as a moment um, where there's both um, distress, but also the possibility of some learning to take place. And then you said, Lara, but I can see her point of view. Yeah. <laughs> that is the story in the story. I could see her point of view. I, I could see your point of view because also I cried the first time I saw La Pietà. But uh, this woman, I resonated with her a lot because I am um, a daughter of uh, an Italian Catholic family. And I know what uh, this kind of uh, family can do to, to little 
uh, La Pietà is a fantastic piece of sculpture, of, of art, but I don't look at the, uh, at the spiritual aspect of it. I look at the artistic aspect. And that, uh, that was uh, the interest to look at the same object because you took out all these spiritual qualities uh, like a sort of a transcendence uh, in the, while I saw the materiality of the object, which is by, by the way, it's marble. Uh, maybe some people want to react to this. I, I said mm. that, I said to Christy that we were ready to take maybe some reaction. Uh, and John says that my voice is very, okay, I try to speak louder. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, maybe so, if, if you want to write uh, questions or reactions, we can take them eh? and we go on, but uh, Christy will signal if there is a uh, something interesting to react to. Uh, we quoted Bollas here. Chris, what is very interesting in his discourse is that he says, we live every single moment of our life in an evocative word. The word, we take the word as uh, something given, something out there. It's uh, normal, it's objective. It's not like that because we, continuously we, we interact with this word. There's a part of us which is unconscious, which is embodied, and we don't even know that we are interacting with this fantastic word of, uh, of uh, buildings, of nature. Hi. Of Hi. Oh. <laughs> I heard uh, some noise. Does anyone want to talk no somebody's trying to communicate something I, I think so yeah no maybe not let's see so the idea is to treat the objects not as if they were uh, guaranteed but uh, become curious every object can create a new story and an, and so in that moment, I was very upset with Linden because uh, I wanted to do this exercise, the, what do you see, based on this idea of the metalogue, and what he brings to me to discuss an image of La Pietà. I was really upset. I didn't want to discuss about this image. <laughs> but that's what uh, dialogue means. The other brings in the place something that you don't expect, that you don't even want. <laughs> And this happens all the time in adult education, in education in general. But with adults, of course, it's very interesting because adults have a perspective which is sometimes very, very fixed because it is biographically rooted. And uh, we tend to love our perspective and to think that that is the only one. We don't need anything else. Should I go on? Someone added please. something in the conversation. Would you like me to share it with everyone? Please, yes. Sure. Yes. And he mentioned he, he wouldn't have us thinking about transformative learning in this way. That, that Christy, it's hard to hear you. Yes. Sorry. Sorry, I turned my mic up. Sorry. <laughs> Thinking about transformative learning in this way moves us away from the idea of it as epical, more of an epoch more of a way of being in the world. Mm. thought that was powerful. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That is a good question. Yeah, I tend to think that sometimes some interpretations of Mezzeron's work uh, bring us to a very abstract attitude, more uh, mental, more rational. Mental, for Bateson, the mind is immanent, is uh, embodied, is embedded always uh, inside. But I don't, I'm not sure if uh, Mezirov thought like that because uh, Linden, it's in the next... Uh, yeah, let, let's go Linden on to that. Linden quotes this phrase, which is very interesting from uh, the first book, life is from the perspective. And this is Mezirov, right, Linden? Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to say before we get on to Jack Mezirov and... Um, yeah. I, I guess um, 
I mean, like you, I, I was, I was um, after initially feeling quite anxious and anxiety as part of the human condition in the context of this discussion. Um, I mean, you, you have a, a, a way of um, talking about evocative objects um, that, that I began to find very compelling. So you do a lot of work on marble and light and dark and shade. And I think what you were communicating to me, and I was beginning to realize that my perspective on this maybe was shifting a little bit, was that Michelangelo had worked with materiality <laughs> and for me had created something profoundly spiritual. So I was beginning to kind of um, straddle what had been maybe a um, um, constraining binary between the material and the spiritual. And, and here was something that we can see, maybe it evokes a spiritual, maybe a very powerful spiritual response in us, but it's actually created by human hand. Maybe there's a divine intervention, uh, in, inspiration at work. And it's the way the marble is shaped and moved and the effect of the light and the shade, which which creates the sense of the numinous or whatever. So immediately I was into a discussion with you and with myself about what is the relationship then between the material and the spiritual when we so often separate them apart. Yeah, but then, you know, I told you that Michelangelo did four different uh, statues mm -hmm. of La Pietà in different moments of his life. This is uh, uh, an object of the 30s. Is very classical. In, in a way, it is rational. It's perfect. There is a perfect uh, shape. Uh, he, he's very classical, like uh, ancient Greece, you know. Yeah. But when we, he was old, he was 84 and almost dying. Yeah. He did the La Pietà della Rondanini, which is in Milano. I've seen and it. That, yeah. that yeah. was meant to be unfinished. It was, yeah. uh, and it was unfinished because he died. He worked on it until the last day, but he, he's, it was meant to be unfinished because Michelangelo in the years, the coming of age, began to think that uh, reality is not perfect and that, that there is something rough and something that might stay uh, not, with a, not unshaped. I, I don't have the words sometimes, mm -hmm. not with a, a very nice shape because life is dark also it, yeah. it has not always this very nice shape you know yeah, it's so interesting. I, I prefer the la pietà romandanini now sure. when i saw I that, that i found that if, if i saw the, found the first one kind of i don't know touching the spiritual in me the second one was a very very disturbing and very dark as you say yeah so there's another perspective at, at work there that i think we need to engage in as human beings. There's a, there's a darkness and disturbance in our journeys, our pilgrimages, and maybe in our transformations that we need to take hold of as well. Yeah, and uh, artists know it better, better than us academics, because the artists, they go straight to the point and they are able to represent in the same object both the light and the dark. Why for us, we have to develop a long discourse with many words just to arrive <laughs> to, to the concept. Sure. I like art for that. I started to use arts-based methodologies because art uh, is very rapid. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Mezziro anyway. Yeah. Because... I, again, to ask if, 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 if I'm, I'm looking at the chat group and... Uh, um, we, we, like, we do like to work interactively. Yeah, and I'm trying to learn my way into, they are, they are into interactivity. But um, I, apart from John saying, impressive to see so many participating, that's all I've got so far. Yeah, well, they will come in the end, maybe. Let's go on with this uh, idea of uh, measure and uh, the issues the issues about uh, Wait, what Laura yeah this is Jelena we do have a question that just popped up if you all want to go ahead and take that before you start to the next one yes okay, so this question is from Marcus Stefan is yeah. um, could you give a few examples of what you mean by the dark uh, <laughs> well Lyndon has his own but I would say 
for me, the dark exists because of the light and the, the light exists because of the dark. I see the dark in relation to the light. So every concept that we have has, um, has two, two sides in a way. Uh, the, the disorientating dilemmas of which uh, Mesero talks are the, are the stuff of our life. Uh, the human being is double. Bateson says that we are like split in, uh, in two parts. Uh, if you want, you can talk about the conscious and the unconscious. It's one way to, to talk about that or the mind and the body. But uh, since we are used to separate these two parts and consider them independent one from the other, we don't see the, uh, their uh, interdependence. So. M uh, Jung says more light means more dark yeah. uh, and that's uh, the condition the human condition is that so <laughs> I think this is the point of departure sure and, I, 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 I to... yeah I, I, it's, this, this issue is with me at the moment partly because of a doctoral student that I have who um, doesn't like me going on about the light all the time when the person concerned sees so much dark and why is the dark not a source of potential transformation as well? Um, I mean that's an interesting d discussion, do we privilege light over, over darkness and can we come at things in the dark because we may see things in a different way and that might be, be helpful. I suppose what it makes me think of when you, you say some examples, particularly if you uh, are researching with um, adult students, and asking about the, the stories of, of learning. Yeah, there are, there are moments where, um, oh God, I understand something now, which otherwise I wouldn't have done. But there's also a hell of a lot of dark and struggle and difficulty and lostness. And whether the metaphor or the, the notion of dark works in that regard, I think these are part of, you know, the, the transformative process whatever we mean by by that we we're lost we we i mean dante uses the the imagery of the the thicket the wood where we can't see anything where we're we're entrapped and i i find that resonates in the stories of many adult learners whether we're talking about people who are returning to education maybe after a difficult first time round or even in the lives of professionals doctors who, who lose their way and talk of very dark times indeed and a darkness in relation to their patients that they cannot handle and they have to try and find a way of um, a way out of the, of the darkness to be able to to carry on yeah and maybe also sometimes stay in the darkness I say yeah one of the problems of our um, culture is that we refuse the dark yeah. we refuse to 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 go in this direction we refuse what is ours so sometimes it's uh, safer it's uh, healthier to stay in the dark or to accept that uh, we live in dark times i often say to linden uh, it is normal to be depressed in the present it's um, it's healthier to be depressed. It's not a symptom because the, we live in troubled times. There is injustice. There is people dying for nothing. There is really very bad things happening all over the world. So why we should be uh, always looking for the positive? That's a sort of craziness. It's an obsession for the positive. And I speak of this, but Linden says to me that I am the, the optimistic one and he is the pessimistic one. But uh, writing this book for me was really to come, to come more, uh, uh, yes, to accept better that uh, a pessimist side of my personality is very, very, it's there. And it's very important because life becomes thicker if you have both sides. If you forget uh, all the other part, your life becomes very superficial. And uh, as educators, we cannot afford this because we have to do with people and these people have their dark side. And uh, sometimes uh, we are the only people, the only ones in the world who are 
uh, there to to help to to put some words or to give a shape to the darkness. I do that a lot. I, I give names, uh, like Freire said, you know, when you are in the darkness, it's important to give a name to this darkness, not uh, to forget it or, to, or put it under, the, under the, the rug, as we say in Italian. I don't know if it works in English, but... Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I, well, Mesero I think the association is very American in this sense. Mesero is very American. I mean, uh, the disorienti disorientating dilemmas for some people become something useful but to overcome because you need to be oriented orientated to be disoriented to be uncertain is very bad while for me now to be uncertain becomes uh, as i said healthier does it have any sense any sense this yeah i i just want to say and i i, I think people are now trying to to comment and I oh, want to engage with them. I just want to say that one association I had when you were talking, um, and maybe this is a because of my training as a psychologist, psychotherapist, we, we are trained to stay with the dark. And well, that might sound a bit remote for people, but there is a, um, a very powerful tradition, I think, um, in not just um, depth psychology, but also in poetry. Sometimes it goes under the label of negative capability. And I think it is the capacity to be in something, whether it's dark or whatever it is, without wanting to grab at something else. You, you've got to stay in that place. You've got to be in it. You've got to live in it rather than grabbing at facts or certainty or um, something that's going to give you a complete explanation as quickly as possible. Help, get me out of this. And I think that that inhibits, in a certain sense, important processes that can begin to uh, unfold. If you have faith that something is going to emerge eventually out of the, the process. Uh, the, the poet I was thinking of is John Keats, who, who writes about negative capability. So the capacity to, to stay with the thing, to be with it. Uh, and I think this applies not just to work in a therapeutic setting, but it also applies in adult education settings, seems to me to be very important because we, we want to run away. We want to go and find immediately the answer to all this. We want light immediately. Yeah, yeah. I am reading the, um, the questions and the commentaries, very interesting. Uh, what Becky says, for example, she says, uh, would you say the dark could be the turmoil and the unease that uh, is before transformation? Well, that is, uh, um, I think it's a narrow way to, to think about the dark. The dark only as something mm -hmm. that preludes to change. Many narratives of adult education have to do with success with cha oh yes, uh, I transformed. So I, I was uneasy before, but now I, have, I am transformed, so I am happy. I think this narrative is bad. <laughs> it's a bad narrative. In the, in the end, what I see at my age is that uh, tr transformation is very difficult. I'm not sure if I am able to transform at all. If we talk about uh, transformation and not uh, superficial learning, Transformation for me means uh, learning two or learning three in Bateson's terms, which is a big reassessment, a restructuration of your perspective. So turmoil sometimes only brings turmoil and uneasiness. It's not always successful. I, I say it's very, it's very bad, but it is like that. And the dark is uh, not necessary, but it is there. I mean, we cannot, uh, we cannot avoid it. We can try to avoid it, but it comes back. So as John says, uh, the shadowing, engaging the dark means um, to, to live the full life. Uh, um, when I was uh, around my 30s, I got very upset with a colleague who really bothered me, uh, a woman colleague, very bad, very bad. <laughs> And my, 
co-therapist at the time who was a systemic therapist, but he knew a lot about Jung. He said to me, you know, Laura, if you are so upset with this person, it means that she represents your shadow, something that you forgot of yourself or that mm. you don't want to admit about yourself. So think about what you can learn uh, from that uh, idea. And it was very useful. I used that for many, many other occasions. I'm not always good in that, but uh, I try. You know, Indians say namaste. Uh, they say in, in India, they say, you are my master. Even if you bother me, or because you bother me, you are my master. Uh, so you can use it for a colleague, for a, a son, for a friend. Um, it's life. In everyday interactions, we face dark always uh, when we interact with others and with, when we interact with ourselves. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the uh, comments and um, there's Marcus and Becky and um, John has come in um, and also um, Metrif. Um, I, I think the, the, the first one um, about darkness being, if I can find it again, but darkness being um, seen in, in, in negative terms. Um, I, I think that it has more to offer, I suspect. Uh, I know that at a, at a simple level to see a a landscape in the dark can be frightening and we might want to run away and find the light. Um, but um, maybe if we just stay with it, we begin to see things and we begin to, 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 to notice things. Maybe we even begin to see the stars eventually if we can get through the pollution. So I, I, I think our metaphors of light and darkness, they're so loaded. I mean, darkness, you're right, Marcus, I think is, is very much seen as, um, you know, the, the bad, the evil, whereas the light is, is the, you know, the eternal city. And I, I, I think that um, that's, again, maybe a false misleading binary. I, I think whatever we make of this thing called transformation, and both Lara and I have got many questions about the use of this term. And um, sometimes I'm very skeptical in the way it is used, but if it's going to make any sense uh, to me and the stories I hear from countless adult learners, then it must encompass the dark, not simply as a negative thing, uh, but also as the way of beginning to see things uh, slightly differently. I think, uh, Marcus, when, he, when you speak about ambiguity, uh, I, I like a lot the ambiguity. I mean, Ambiguity allows us to keep the dialogue open because when we think that things are clear, we stop putting questions. So this, we are talking about something very difficult because it is something uh, that is unconscious, that is uh, our body, that is beyond our uh, capacity of uh, talk. And uh, I, 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 I quote again Freire because Freire said, about naming, naming the world and uh, the people who learn how to name things, they get free from oppression. Mm. But it is not always the case. I mean, you, you are free in this moment because you grasp the meaning of something which is relevant for you. But then after a few minutes or hours or in another context, the same experience, the same object changed, changed the meaning. So for me, this is also my epistemology. I don't think that the word is a fix. The word is moving. I am moving in the word. So ambiguity is a way to represent this movement. Of course, it is an epistemology. There are other people who like to think that the word is stable and that certainty about what's going on, what is true, what is false is um, is relevant to them, so I respect that because uh, it is a sort of a, maybe a personality. I don't know how to define this. Uh, I want to say to to uh, Becky, um, 
about Jung. We're, we're going to go on to Jung and Freud a little bit in a minute, um, because if, we, if there is a theme maybe lurking in some of what we're saying, um, I think we can see um, Freud for very good reasons, as he would say, and I think I understand him on this, um, takes a slightly more pessimistic view of the human condition, whereas Jung takes a, um, a slightly more optimistic view, which doesn't mean that anything remotely to do with transformation isn't difficult, far from it, because as John would say, engaging with our shadow is a hellishly difficult business. But nonetheless, I think Jung thinks we, we can, we can um, find our way to something which is um, potentially bringing the different parts of ourselves together, which makes the whole more than the sum of the parts, whereas Freud has a much more restricted view that really we can only move from neurosis to um, the usual human un unhappiness. That's as far as Freud is prepared to go with these things. I don't know what he would have made, by the way, of oh a lot God. of the transformative literature. Can we, can we just go back a moment to Mesereau? Yeah, but uh, this was my fault. I'm, I'm not good in... Ah! <laughs> okay, <laughs> now it worked. Now, uh, can I say something about this? Because, of course, this creates a big problem. We live in the era of ideological talks, of fake news. Everybody can say anything they want. So if I speak about a world which is moving and uh, it seems a re very relativistic attitude, which is not. So I want to be very clear about this. Uh, if we want to, see, to stay in a real dialogue with the other, we need to have a posture uh, that is not ideological or since ideology is, not, uh, is another of these things that we have to, to accept because we are ideological beings but ideology can be recognized and I can, I can know when I am ideological and when I need to make a step back. This, this is a main learning for our time. I think that in university, for example, it is a, a task for us as teachers to allow these young adults to learn the difference between ideology being ideological using your perspective uh, to, to kill the others, <laughs> or mm -hmm. using your perspective to understand the world of the others. It's a totally different posture. Sure. I think we want to come on to as well, Sorry. don't we? I, I, I'm making a, a mess. Okay. I just want to say about, um, the by the way. You wanted to say something about Mezzero. Yeah. yeah, I did. But can I just pick up on Lisa first of all? I'm sorry, this is um, yeah. jumping about a bit, but I'm, I'm looking at the uh, chat group as well. Um, Lisa's talking here about um, that we have to wrestle with, with, with the darkness, uh, crossroads, um, uh, and light is on the other side. Um, I think so, and I think um, that's what I tell my students. But there, there's a danger, I think, here that um, of what we might call the linear pilgrimage, that we go through the darkness and then we move into the light and everything's fine forever afterwards. afterwards. I, I don't think that's what it's like at all. Uh, and again, I, I speak, of course, I do my, my autobiography is there, but listening to stories of many people, I, th I think we may come into moments of light and we may see things, if I can use the metaphor positively, we may see things freshly, joyfully, mm. but I think we also then might lose our way again. <laughs> I, I don't think the journey is linear. That's what I think I'm trying to allude to. And I'm older than, 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 than Lara, and I think, my goodness, I finally arrived in the celestial city. Don't believe a word of it, as I keep on finding out. I have my moments, again, of darkness and, and doubt. And somehow I think we, we may sell people short if we over-talk the linear journey of transformation. I see it much more as, a, I don't know what metaphor people want to use, or what image. I'm constantly going backwards and 
and, and forwards and maybe a little bit further um, the next time, but then the, the darkness descends. I have a lot of doubt and uncertainty. I, I think I know, and sometimes when I've been given, giving talks or lectures, my goodness, I sound as though I know. And then I, in my, in my dreams or whatever, and when I'm thinking to myself in the morning, do I really understand that? Or do I really know so confidently? And then the kind of darkness descends again a little bit. Yeah. Do you want to talk about Mesra? This game, yeah, in this game, I, I li I'm reading Lisa and also John commentaries. Um, I, I, I like your comments. Lisa, Lisa I think, yeah, yeah. I think that this uh, cycle between light and dark, or many other cycles, because we can take other uh, polarities in our lives, and everything is cycle in yeah. the end. And this is learning. It's, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if it is transformative. It becomes transformative when, from the cycle, you are able to transcend, in a way. I, in this part of my life, I think that uh, it would be really interesting to free myself a little bit from this uh, ego and from this um, very Western self. I am very attracted by other cultures because uh, my impression is that in other traditions, the self is less uh, re reified. It is less individual or individualistic. It's more like um, a shared, a shared thing. In um, in our cultures, we tend to be very selfish. Selfish. <laughs> it's something very personal. I belong to myself, you know, and the other who enters. Yeah, but uh, all this discourse has to do with uncertainty. I don't know if uh, you are. Um, familiar with Edgar Morin uh, books. He's a French uh, sociologist. I think it's translated in English. Complexity, theories of complexity. Mm -hmm. And Morin says that the gift of the 20th century to humanity was uncertainty. Because for the first time, in, uh, at least in the Western tradition, we had uh, uh, theories, uh, philosophies, uh, uh, politics that didn't give for granted the truth. And uh, so this brought to us more choices, even democracy, if you want. Democracy becomes uh, a way to, to have more choices. But if you have more choice, you are more uncertain. And uh, maybe one of the reasons that democracy is not working is this, that people don't know how to manage with uncertainty. Mm. Hmm. How to become friends with uncertainty? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say on the on the transformation thing, um, and I I don't know uh, the answer, but I do think that going back to Bauman, that Bauman talks about the contemporary existence as one of perpetual striving, maybe because we're frightened of falling behind and then being labelled as outsiders, the dispossessed. Uh, failures and all the other language which exudes from within our, our culture. And I, I think some of us who've been successful relatively in education are people who um, have striven to striven for this, striven for that, striven for a doctorate even or whatever it might be. And in fact in my own in my own journey, and this works at many different levels, it's actually moving away from striving, including embracing and celebrating my own ordinariness. So I'm not, you know, we're all special, but we're all in a sense ordinary too, and that needs to come into our sensibility towards the, these, these things. So um, I, I, think, I think I'm with Bauman on this point, that, I mean, striving is part of the experience, part of what might be the good in human life, but it can also be pretty horrific if we can never settle down and never be at peace, never, you know, stare at an ocean and just enjoy it because we have to go off and write the next book or the next doctorate or whatever it happens to be. And, and for me, that's very much an, an acceptance of a very ordinary part of me, which in a certain sense I've often denied. And now I feel much more comfortable in myself that, that I can accept that and I'm not quite the special, wonderful being that 
that, that somehow I've, 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 I've tried to be maybe to please my parents or whoever it happens to be. Hmm. Do you, I was going to talk I about having conversations in this period with, we have to go forward. No, I yeah. wanted to say something about the new generations because what you are saying uh, is also linked to the period of life that you are living. Yeah. But when we speak of adults, we speak of people from 18 to 100. And uh, the young adults now, they are different. So I'm very curious about these millennials and the post millennials. Uh, sometimes they teach me, they are more wiser than, uh, than us, I think, in respect to this. Some of them. I'm, I'm not sure about everybody, but. Should we go to the next? Uh, we, have... we haven't really. Uh, do you think we've done enough on Mesera? I mean. Well, uh, there is a lot of, to say about Mesera, of course. I mean, what I liked about what you brought to me about Mesera, I mean, I confess that, that I, I was more on the Dirksian side of things. Yeah. Um, than, than with Jack Meserau and I, I, I think I did him a bit of an injustice. Meserau actually took me into um, a real appreciation of American pragmatism. I mean, the word pragmatism has a, a very negative connotation um, when, when I have heard it in the past. But, but I love the notion of um, a search for social forms and we could add individual lives um, that, that are good and beautiful and work for a while. I love that language. And in fact, it was engaging with you on Meserau and going back to the American pragmatists that made me think part of our problem with transformation is we don't, we, we've lost a language. Maybe our language is too scientific and we need a more poetic language, which includes things like love and beautiful. Joy is another word I think incredibly oh, important, yeah. as well as the dark stuff. Well, we need those words to help us. And when you look at Mesra's own biography, I think it's very interesting. It's, it's full of, I mean, disorientating dilemmas gets put down as a category and then it's somehow forgotten. But for him, they were pretty profound and disturbing moments, as I understand it. I mean, the you know, engaging with, with Frere and others, um, and then realizing actually um, he wasn't necessarily practicing, practicing what he was preaching, um, that, that somehow that he was doing exactly what he should not do and was actually controlling people sometimes, as well as the disorientating dilemma that came from Edie, isn't it? Um, deciding she was going to return to um, education Ah, yes. and of course, that took him into the whole business of oh, the national project, as I understand it, on, on women's education. Yeah. Where I think I still slightly differ with, with Jack is that um, when I've listened to um, chronicled many people's stories, women's stories, about, about moments of, is it transformation? Certainly moments that enable them to keep on keeping on in, in education. It's often about things like uh, a moment where they feel seen and recognized in a seminar for the first time. You know, they're moving from um, a, a place where they feel they don't belong in a seminar. Uh, and maybe a, a professor looks at them and, and looks right through them and goes on to someone else. And some of the stories people want to run away at that point. And then they find a professor and, you know, a moment where we've all tried to say something in a seminar and our throat dries and we can hardly get words out. And then um, you, you manage to string a few sentences together, maybe because of a bit of a love of literature you have. And the professor looks at you and says something like, it's very interesting, Brenda, would you like to say a bit more? And we don't understand actually, unless you view it through a biographical lens, the enormity of those moments. So the idea that in the last resort, it's all about stuff in the head and the head is clearly important. Um, rather than other processes, and we might want to use words like recognition. We might even want to use words like love, not in a narcissistic sense, but really coming alongside and seeing someone and what they're trying to say and what they're struggling about. Those things seem to me to be more important or as important. And I think there's a danger of reductionism sometimes in the way we talk about transformative learning. So I'm still having that bit of an argument with Jack Mesera. Yeah. Well, I, 
I am the translator of some of the, the Mezzero's work in Italian. Uh, I think uh, it's very interesting for a country like, like Italy to have someone who systematize uh, thinking in this way. Uh, and that's one reason for uh, Mezzero. It's, it's not very famous. In Italy, there is some people who follow his work, but it didn't become very influential because the Italian pedagogy and also education is um, very ideological. It's very um, vertical in a way. So this pragmatism, you know that you, even John Dewey's work was translated very late. And there were universities in Italy when, where it was not taught at all, Dewey. So, you know, in a country where ideology is very strong, Someone who brings this uh, systematic idea of transform transformative learning can really be very, very interesting. What I like less is uh, the um, phases, uh, this, uh, the order of the this, ten, the ten are, uh, different steps, the ten mm. steps. This kind of things is not in my, <laughs> but this is also, you know, uh, a, dif a different epistemology in a way. Hmm. Uh, let's go to the next. Well, we we already talked a lot about uh, depth psychology in a way uh, when we talked about the darkness. But uh, you mentioned uh, Sabina Spielrein, and uh, it is very very interesting that in the last years there were so many um, conferences, uh, movies, books uh, of people who try to show that the presence of this woman uh, between Freud and Jung was uh, very influential. She was very clever. She was not only, you know, the sexy patient. She was no. someone with a, with a head, someone with a strong sensibility. She brought her ideas in a, in a dialogue with uh, both of them, mm. the two men. <laughs> and it's uh, really a pity that it took so much time to recognize that this woman is a, a, a pillar of psychoanalysis in a way. It is. It is a pity. And uh, I think her paper... Loud noise. Um, I think her papers were only discovered in the 1990s, maybe it was a bit before then, um, somewhere in the archives of the Viennese uh, Psychoanalytic Society. Um, I, I think she gave as much to Jung as he was able to take from her. Very, Very interesting, because she, she was analysed both by Freud and Jung. Um, and in a way, um, her life uh, represents aspects of the stuff that Freud was worried about, ironically. Uh, people might not know, but uh, she was Jewish. She came from Rostov-on-Don um, in the then Soviet Union. She, she was trained as a psychiatrist and then as a psychoanalyst. Um, very distinguished. And um, what Freud had been warning us of is that we mustn't get trapped into the illusion that we are not pretty nasty beings as well, that we are very competitive, very destructive, we are sexually competitive, we compete for, for space, we compete for all kinds of things. I go to university meetings and I see a lot of <laughs> these activities a lot of the time. Um, but in, 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 in 1942, she was in Rostov on Don and tragedy, absolute tragedy, which, you know, kind of illustrates maybe an aspect of all this because um, her town was overrun by um, a Nazi death squad and she was murdered. Yeah. And it's only, um, as I said, relatively recently that her papers have been found and the contribution she makes, including this instinct for transformation that's something in us that wants us to keep going that 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 wants us to keep on on our journey however difficult however dark the wood and um in a sense as a life force freud talked about the libido as basically sexual he said to 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 freud said to jung you are frightened of sex and Jung, in turn, said to Freud, you're obsessed with sex. 
so so for Freud, libido is very kind of sexual. Uh, for for Jung, it's much more about a life force that wants to find expression, that wants us to make of ourselves something more fulsome. Um, so there's quite a different emphasis in b between between the two of them. But Spielwein has got a very significant role to play in that. I also, Lara, love the um, people might not know, but Jung was quite. Um, taken or maybe enchanted by Dante yeah. and, um, and uh, the, the, the Divine Comedy. And we've, we've also written about, about that. Yeah, in the I, I'm not a Jungian, I, I don't, um, I, well, I say that, I, I, there's part of me that is. Um, at the beginning I talked about object relations, which is about the relationships we have between bits of people or whole people and the way we internalize them. So what's inter becomes intra. And I can read into Virgil, into, into Dante, and thus Jung, Jung's interpretation of these things. The importance of the relationship. So he has a relationship with Virgil that takes him out of this dark wood. Uh, the wisdom of Virgil is something he, he celebrates. And then, of course, there's the, the the love he has for a Florentine nobleman, noble woman, noble man, noble woman. Maybe he was a nobleman. Anyway, um, and and that's an important stage of the the journey. And then, of course, the the role of the Virgin Mary, and and the Christ figure. And I think what Jung is alluding to is important in Dante, and maybe Spielwein is pointing to this as well is that the glimpses of the numinous and the divine can help us on our journey. So however dark and difficult, it's a sense of something drawing us, maybe to purgatory and eventually to see um, the celestial city, however long we stay there uh, for, or however much that works as a metaphor for people. Um, but this journey of the soul, which I think is, uh, is what, what is being talked about here, that soulfulness lies at the heart, if you like, of transformative process it strikes me as something very much worth engaging with yeah as you know i my personal interpretation of this soul work is very embodied mm. and uh, i think that there is not real difference between uh, uh, all these concepts that uh, by the way come from john <laughs> john dirks yes, there's a picture of him there so, yeah there is might not have been on had him. Known he was going to this, be involved this concept in this. of soulfulness of the everyday for me, is the, uh, the perception, how we, it's magic. We go around, we move, and we perceive. We have all these senses, many more than five, uh, and uh, we are totally anesthetized because of our education. And the, the body is uh, one of the less... Uh, <laughs> Uh, part of us uh, which are less uh, taken in, in, in consideration mm. adult education is disembodied in many occasions is everything is here in the words in uh, discourse while we have bodies we move we breathe in the book re-enchanting the academy which which was a conference in your university mm. i wrote a chapter on uh, re-embodied re-embody the academy the academy is disembodied Mm. Uh, bodies are uh, disciplined. Uh, this is Foucault. Disciplined. Everybody stay in the same place with the same attitude. There is no difference. No, uh, um, they're not taking charge of the, of the need of perceiving, of using the senses, all the senses. The visual is dominating on all the other senses. So there is a lot to do to re-enchant, uh, to bring uh, depth and to bring soul. The body is one of the, of the doors. I think the door. Uh, my, why mindfulness is becoming so interesting? Why, why so many people are doing these uh, embodied experiences of breathing in silence? Wow, that's fantastic. Why? Because you, this is a way to go deeper into yourself. If you use that, not uh, only as a marketable uh, solution for all the problems, because that, that is another interpretation of mindfulness that I hate, by the way. So here we have these 
um, these ideas of joy, of beauty, of uh, feeling at home in your own uh, everyday experience, which can be a very interesting for an adult. Uh, sometimes adults forget about this because they are so taken into the, the every, uh, you know, everyday problems, struggles, responsibilities. I, I think, Lara, the problem isn't just with the adult learner, it's also with the teacher. And I, I think that it depends on what's working through him or her, which perspectives. And I, I think there is a way of languaging the world, if we can use that phrase, that, that takes the life and soul out of the party, as it were. Um, and I think that's where um, John's contribution has been significant. I also go back to Libby, Libby Tisdall, because in writing about a pilgrimage, and I've done pilgrimage, I, I and but she, she uses a simple thing, which, but it's just so evocative. Um, the joy of getting up in the morning and seeing a sunflower turn its head towards the sun. Now, I suspect in a lot of our institutions and a lot of our lives, maybe, we're too busy going so quickly that we don't notice the sunflower turning to the sun. And also, um, with, with John, um, I, I'm, I'm a, an avid reader, I'm a bibliophile, and I love my books. But sometimes I'm rushing through them and then something speaks to me. And I, I can only use, or the language I need, to get near to what the experience can be is something like awesome beauty because an idea that speaks to me not up here simply but in my whole being in my body and i feel it in the in the depths of my experience it's speaking to me it's helping me to make sense of, of something you might be um feeling stirred quite profoundly so in a uh, a lecture. It may be our souls singing in a seminar where the seminar feels together and my goodness we have a sense of joy that we've understood something. And yeah. part of my difficulty with this is that our language has been debased of this kind. John, John sent a, a message about the mythopoetic which I think is part of what I'm alluding to. That the, the, the language we, we, we've used, maybe it's a very secular language, uh, is losing. We are desensitized to some of these processes. And if our teachers in our courses or classes uh, are not able to help us to, to, to notice and to come alive, as it were, in, in, in particular uh, moments, then I think we're all um, devalued uh, as, a, as, a, as a result. In fact, I want to say that sometimes it isn't so much the re-enchantment that happens in the academy. We are back into diabolical and the empty and the soulless. And I think all of us have a responsibility as educators to try to work a little bit beyond that. And maybe we can make a contribution to re-enchanting things. Yeah, while you are talking, I am also answering to a couple of questions about this uh, thing of disembodiment. Uh, now, for example, in this moment, I don't feel that uh, I am anesthetized. I don't know about the 60 people who are there. If you feel anesthetized or you feel embodied, I don't think that online learning is more disembodied than in presence. On the contrary, sometimes uh, it's paradoxical. I am experimenting in these very days. Online learning becomes more embodied than in presence, which uh, interrogates me quite a lot. <laughs> uh, so this embodiment has not only to do with, uh, with the physical body, it has to do with your attitude, the kind of dialogue you have, the kind of words you use. Because if you tell your life, if you tell your biography, for example, using the body language, using sp speaking about um, the flavor of, uh, I don't know, your grandmother's uh, tart. Uh, you speak about uh, smells, bad smells uh, in your life. It's the smell of the hospital, uh, the smell of the hospital in my childhood. I was a very hospitalized girl. So these kind of memories are very embodied, even if in that moment you are telling, you are wor using words. 
So it's not, um, it's not a problem of, of being there physically. It's a problem of how you are there. Mm. Uh, what is your attitude? What is the kind of dialogue that you are having? So this is a research for, uh, for, for the whole uh, life. I mean, when I started to use embodied methods um, 12 years ago around, uh, I discovered a sort of gold mine. So, and it is also very funny. But it is, uh, first of all, a way to bring the people really there. Because if you ask people to be there and you create a, a, presen a real presence, then you can do a lot of things. But what I see in education is that people are not there. Uh, it's very difficult to convince, for example, also in the university, convince the students to be there in the class. Linden was saying something important about the relationship. You know. mm. If you are an adult educator, you have these, uh, uh, these tools. I, would, I wouldn't like to, to call them tools, but it's a way of doing, it's a way of putting questions of involving the people in the conversation, which is in the tradition. And we can go to the next slide because it is in the yeah. tradition of yeah. adult education. Yeah. But there are uh, also... Jo John, by the way, has remarked that he finds he's in the, he's in the dark side when he's doing a writing an online module. I think I understand that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I mean, this is well, not, but uh, this is, this is generational. John, John, this is the generational, I think. We have to admit that we belong to another generation. And also when, uh, you know, uh, Gutenberg invented the print, uh, uh, some people said this is going to destroy every possibility to know. People will be unable to know because knowledge is not about this uh, crazy thing. Or, you know, technology is always a problem, but it's the way it is used. It's not technology itself. <laughs> we are old people. We must admit that. John uh, isn't entirely convinced. Shall we go? Is very, Linden is very pessimistic about technology, I know, because we had a lot of fights on that. I think right. it becomes a fetish, Lara, on, on, on occasion. It's going to solve I totally have, And by the way, one of the metalogues of our book is about the big screen of Samsung that is on the side of the Duomo, the cathedral in Milano. Samsung has uh, sponsorized the cathedral with a big screen and they sell uh, all kind of stuff on that screen. That's crazy. They seduce. They seduce people into absolutely, selling, absolutely. into buying. Um, the symbol of Christianity is used for that. That's crazy, really. By sexy young models and BMWs on the side of a cathedral. Yeah. yeah. Bizarre. Oops. And yet yeah. somehow the, you know, this is maybe it's it's a stage of, you know, advanced capitalism or something that the the objects which generations have regarded as sacred, even they are now completely invaded by Samsung screens and BMWs yeah. and sexy young models. And if you buy the latest iPhone, then my goodness, you can find your way to transformation. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but that is a conversation that brings us in another direction. Now, let's talk about chapter eight, which was one of the uh, most interesting for me because Linden obliged me, no, you didn't oblige me, but I felt obliged to go back and study the story, the history of adult education in my country, uh, which is fascinating. And I wrote, I, I think I wrote uh, 70 pages, but Linden said, we cannot uh, put 70 pages, so you have to cut. <laughs> I have already the material for another book. But, but the idea to make a dialogue between uh, UK and Italy, because we speak about what we know, we speak about our own uh, roots. Uh, so we have Tony and uh, uh, Tony Freire and uh, um, Carla Lonzi. This is sort of triad. Uh, of course, uh, there are many more friends and authors in the, in the chapter, but these three, they are very symbolic. Do you want to... to I just want to say, I, I just wished I could get your, your Italian tonality here, but I remember you saying to me, Lyndon, this is all his story. What about her story? And I, I, 
I, I was guilty. There were uh, no women at all. Well, the first version of the, the chapter was only men, like adult education is only men. Yeah. And I well, remember Liberty's the once she said in a conference, you are only to, quoting men. And so I had to study and uh, there are a lot of women who made the history of Italian adult education. Some of them uh, are still living. For example, uh, it, it is Italian, one lady, Sofia Corradi, who invented the Erasmus program. You know the Erasmus program in Europe? All these students going around uh, in different countries, making uh, experiences all over the place. She invented it because she was in, uh, I don't know, in Spain, in England, I don't know where, for some years. And then when she came back to Italy, she discovered that it was not possible to have a recognition of the, of the learning she had. So she said, this is not going to happen. We have to find a way to, to, uh, to ask students where. For the US is a different problem because in US the mobility is, is easier. But in Europe, we have frontiers, we have languages, we have totally different laws about higher education, about many, well now, something has changed also because of Sofia. Sofia Corradi, she's considered the mother of the Erasmus program. And then this woman that you see here in the left, Carla Lonzi, I love this lady. She was a feminist. She was really a pain in the ass, as you say, <laughs> for the system. Uh, she, she's translated into English. If you want to, to read some of her uh, uh, pamphlets, uh, you find them in English. She was really disruptive. She was one of the founders of a feminine, feminine Revolt, which was a journal where the first uh, claim was, we don't want to have nothing to do with men, nothing to do with the Communist Party, nothing to do with the church, nothing to do <laughs> with any place ruled by men. So they created their own space. It's fantastic, really. At, at a distance from uh, the position of the present, there is also a problem. Because of course, this choice to create a separated uh, place, in a way, became a boomerang, became a, a, a separation that took years to, to, to be re- I'm not really sure if it was re, uh, reconciled because even now in Italy, when you say feminist, people look at you, oh my God, they don't want to hear this word, feminist is a bad word. So in a way, this revolt, this separation didn't bring uh, big results. But if you analyze it from a cultural point of view, it was great. And it changed in that year, in the 70s, Italy had the best laws. I don't, I don't know in the world, but all the, there were really very good laws about women's body, about self-determination of your health, of uh, everything, uh, contraception, all, all kind of things. And the feminists did, uh, did a lot. They created spaces for education, both informal and formal, because in Italy we had this fantastic law that was the 150 hours. Uh, it is the right of everybody who has a work contract, has the right to use 150 hours a year to study, to do what they want. Even now, but now people don't know that they have this right, so they don't use it. <laughs> Many people don't use it. But if you have a stable contract, you can go to your uh, contractor, to your uh, um, employer. employer and say, I have the right to go to the university 150 hours a year and you have to give me permission because it is a right. That's great. Uh, I but just of want... course, uh, I found also <laughs> many other things. I cannot talk about the, the whole history of Italy because we can stay at, until midnight and uh, it's not good. I, I just wanted to say what, what was John is going. Thanks, John. Um, oh. Thank you for your presence. Ciao, John. I, I just wanted to say one or two things about, um, about 
popular education, as we might call it. Um, what, what, what Laura was challenging me about collided with my own kind of rediscovery of um, the substance of what had been popular education. It was actually an American, uh, Jonathan Rose, who'd written uh, a book um, called The Intellectual History of the British Working Classes that really went back and interrogated some of the history that the end of the 19th century into the 20th century and how important this tradition was, which was much disparaged later on, was to the building of progressive forces in the um, United Kingdom and contributed greatly, I think, to the post-Second War settlement. Um, and I think there are some lovely things in, um, in that history, but also in stuff I've come across in my own work. Um, Richard Henry Tawney there at the top, who uh, was a Christian socialist. And um, I think he was someone who would have said, um, you know, that part of my job is to recognize the divine in the other, the sacred in the other. And I see that as central to my teaching, just as we have to with fundamentalism or brutal ideology. There's a lovely moment in one of his classes where, you know, the group is having a big argument. And this is not dismissing Marxism at all, but there, there is a version of Marxism which is very authoritarian. And we have the truth and nothing but the truth. And therein lies huge danger. And um, someone, someone, the, the audience, some of the seminar is saying, yes, but Professor Tawney, do you not know that in, on page five of Das Kapital it says this? And Tawny says, well, that's an interesting view, but there's another way of seeing it anyway, that the, the, the session, and we've all been there at sessions like these, ended in, people were feeling a bit tangled. And, and what Tawny did was to suggest everybody, this is the UK, by the way, everyone takes tea afterwards, not coffee, tea. And um, he encouraged people to tell stories, maybe recite a poem, maybe sing songs. One of the things that was recited was by Walt Whitman, but I won't go far on that road. And a sense of, of the group coming back together. So the, the role of conviviality is, I think, uh, is gloriously uh, communicated in this story, as well as the, the importance of trying to keep the dialogue going in whatever way we, we can. I've used Frere here because I think Frere, the roots of Frere have not been fully understood. And this is the sort of religious perspective in me, I guess. There's a book by, um, which I came across relatively recently by Erwin Leopando. It's in the list at the end on a pedagogy of faith, the theological vision of Paulo Freire. If you look a lot of, lot of the writing about um, Freire, it's as if he wasn't steeped, grounded in liberation theology. To him, it was fundamental. It was the sense of the divine in the other and the sense of our divine purpose being to intervene in history and to try to shape the, the workings of history in ways that were more socially just and inclusive. And, you know, this is taken out of a lot of writing about adult education, maybe because we don't like talking about such things because it's for, in many places anyway, so, so secularized. So both Tawny and Frere, I think have within them and Frere, much more so than, than Tawny has been a profound influence, of course, in adult education. But we have lost part of what grounded him and what enlivened his spirit. And I think it's been an important uh, omission. Yeah. I think it's interesting now to, to think about the history of adult education because uh, in recent times, uh, this kind of spaces are uh, missing in a way because adults tend to, to go to education for very practical reasons, sometimes for instrumental reasons, or they are obliged to learn because uh, if they want to keep their job, to keep their position in society, they must be flexible, they must be open to learning. So lifelong learning has become, uh, I, I think also in the US, in Europe, surely it has become a sort of a mantra of the neoliberal, uh, uh, neoliberal organization of society. 
while if you study the popular education, uh, social uh, education, it was meant to be places to develop the good citizen, mm. to, to have people who are able to participate in the public life, giving their uh, um, contribution, and also sometimes in open, um, not dialogue, but really disrupting the, the power of those who didn't want them to be. In Italy, we have our pa Paolo Freire, who is Aldo Capitini. He was Catholic, he was a partisan, so he fought for uh, the liberation uh, from fascism. But when, he, when the war finished, he understood that uh, he couldn't be an adult educator be, uh, in, in the power system that was there. So he invented his own place. <laughs> um, he invented spaces for adults to go freely. Uh, they created some uh, kind of circle that met. Uh, he used participatory uh, method, but may maybe the word method didn't exist at the time. Conversations and dialogue. And also Danilo Dolci was another person who used a maieutical approach, like a dialogue in a Socratic way. So the idea was to help these oppressed people, very poor, they were uh, they, they were the last ones. They didn't even know how to read uh, and write, but they learned together in a way which was also developing their um, some self-respect uh, and um, positive action. They were active. Uh, we are going to have a, a conference in a couple of weeks. May, some people of you are coming. I know Anne is coming. In, in Canterbury about activism as an, a part, an inherent part of adult education. Of course, we have to reinterpret activism in the light of the present, in the light of what is needed now. Uh, now there is more awareness of, uh, of the diversity. Maybe Freire, uh, in a way, he was, he, he was criticized by feminists, for example, or by anti-colonialists, because they saw something in his attitude, which was a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe paternalistic. I don't know how to, to define it. So now we know that uh, one of the dangers is to become colonialistic very easily. We, we colonize the, the other, mm. which is a, a really a problem. So uh, I think this is the Can I just last. say one, one other right. thing? Can I just go back just a moment? I just wanted to mention one other thing. That, that is, that is you know, yeah. then we have, I know we need, we need to move towards and finishing. It's just the notion yeah. here yeah. Um, of adult yeah. education as an experiment in democratic education. Yeah. So the, the, what, what, what Tawny, I think Frere, they'd have used different languages, but both of them, and, and this is probably true of, you know, much of what the feminists did as well, that you were trying to create um, in, in the group a, a sense of dialogue, a sense of listening, a sense of equality, a sense of respectfulness, a sense of uh, responsibility as well. For, for the group, in, including dealing with difficult moments like, you know, when we, we, it's not just the fundamentalist who enters the stage. We have bits of the fundamentalist in us where we maybe yeah. say, ah, you know, I have the truth. What are these other people talking about? Um, and it's, it's the moment when you get um, a feeling that people are able to make a contribution without others feeling threatened. And there's a, a collaborative search or, or, or quest um, and what Tawny called that was a kind of manifestation of the kingdom on earth. So in other words, that was an embodiment of what he saw to be a Christian community, where it was possible to work respectively and lovingly and inclusively um, with everyone, so that in the movement we used to call adult education. It is the microcosm of something that's desired on a much 
grander scale. And I suppose some of these things came, became important to me in recent times because it seems to me that democracy, representative democracy is in massive crisis wherever we are. So these yeah. ideas about the work we all have to do, including in our classrooms, um, strike me as purely relevant. They're not just about history. I think they're speaking to some of our deeply disorientating dilemmas here and now. Yeah, yeah. I would say starting from our classrooms because uh, I am very aware that there are issues of uh, power in the academy, issues of uh, uh, misrecognition of the other, and uh, I cannot uh, mystify, I cannot say uh, this doesn't happen, but uh, having a dialogue with the students and be aware when, when the tensions come and using them in a positive way to go on and to develop, that, that is transformative. I, I, I think that in the last years, I learned a lot from the students because I realized that um, they are very different there is a gap, a generational gap. So I need to step back and, and give space to understand better what is their worldview. Sometimes uh, in, the, in the start, I think I was very moralist. I thought, oh, I know the history. And I, I, I told the story in the 70s. Can you imagine? I had a discourse of hope every at morning for breakfast, you know. <laughs> Hope was there. The future is yours. We want the change, we can change the world. And that was fantastic. But for my, my children is not like that. And for my students is not like that. So we need to understand better what is their view. And what's the world they live in. Not our world, but their world. And uh, we go to the last uh, because I, I, I want to leave some more minutes maybe for uh, mm. hearing some voices. This, we, we don't need to go through all of it, but no. the idea was to finish uh, reflecting on, uh, on a methodology for dialogue, if there is a methodology for dialogue. Mm. So here is a sort of a summary of the ideas that we had while we were writing the book and why this is a form of research. And I want to claim it because now I am really fed up with this uh, evidence-based research and uh, uh, positivistic paradigm dominating all, all over the place. I, I was the coordinator of a PhD, so I know that uh, uh, some kind of research uh, is there, it's valuable. I don't, I'm not saying that uh, uh, evidence-based research is uh, shit. Huh? But I am saying that for this kind of uh, uh, exploration, you need to have a, a concept of research. This pilgrimage, this metaphor of the pilgrimage is itself a form of searching. It's a form of creating the new through, through, uh, through exploration, through conversation, reading authors, studying the history, uh, discussing, having dilemmas. This brings you to the new. And knowledge and learning is about the creation of the new. Research is about the creation of the new. Not only about demonstrating one hypothesis mm. or the truth. This is an epistemological claim, but I think it's important because in the US, uh, uh, I know that the mainstream goes in the direction of evidence-based research, but also in Europe is the same. Mm. Not just in, yeah, so every, everywhere, it's global. But I come from a very philosophical tradition. In Italy, as I said, there is a lot of ideology, but this is also, also good in a way, because we have a philosophy of education which is very strong. I don't want to let it uh, go. I want to integrate, to make a dialogue with maybe someone who makes uh, misurations and numbers and find a bridge between uh, what they find and what I think. So I work in the last years, I worked with uh, positivist uh, researchers mm. and uh, it's mm. interesting. The dialogue can be a very good one on both yeah. parts. 
yeah, that takes but when you have this discourse of darkness that we did uh, before, of course, you need a form of research that is not measuring uh, attitudes. It's another kind of research. Yeah, I mean, as you say, I mean, for me, the, the things that um, speak most, um, we have 50 minutes left. Yeah, of course. Um, well, maybe we, we, we leave it there. I, I just want to, um, yeah, there's our, our, our reading list. Writing for me is the search for the beautiful and the, and the truthful. I think we need to re reestablish, although some people do it very well already, um, the aesthetics of writing about adult education in, in ways that speak to the hearts and souls of, you know, people who read and not just to their to their minds and i think there's interesting stuff going on about the mythopoetic or a resacralization um of some of the things that we've been talking about that is helping us on, on along that road um and we, we tried in this book to do as best as we could i think to yeah. to resacralize or re re-enchant i also like the point about otherness it's not just the other and being in dialogue it's about otherness within it's Absolutely. about acknowledging our own complexity, which I think we often find difficult. And you use the phrase with our parents and webs of affiliation, because I feel from my perspective that I'm constantly in dialogue <laughs> with, with, with my parents. They never disappear entirely. They're long dead, but they're not dead. Uh, but also other webs of affiliation in the present and the past, which they're with me from time to time when I pause and listen and I've got continuing conversations with them and I find that kind of language very liberating. I think others do too. Many of my students do too. Yeah, I think that we can take some questions. Please, so yeah. We have uh, some minutes left and we talked a lot. We have. Questions or also some commentaries about uh, what do you think about what we said? We said many things. Do we have any questions? You can open your microphones and go on. My fantasy, Laura, is everyone's gone. No, there is 25 people online. Okay. Right. Yeah, here's one. Here's one. Who are you? Yeah, we were, this is Anne. Hello, Hi. Anne. Hi. Hi. You were talking about technology. <laughs> and uh, when you talked about it, it made me question, so is there a transformative potential to technology? Yeah, I think so. I think that technology is a part of the human. It's not separated from us. We live in a not only human world. And technology is, is a part of it. Why not? So how would it happen? How do you imagine it happening? Or has it happened to you? Well, it happened this year it happened to me because after many years of um, uh, negative feelings, I started a, a blended course and uh, the students were excited. They worked the double that what they do normally in my courses. And they were very happy and they learned more. So in the end I said, okay. And the dialogue with them was much more open because uh, when you use uh, blended learning with the flipped classroom, so they, they were ruling the, 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 the course in fact. Uh, I was astonished about the creativity and, uh, and what they brought into the classroom. So uh, the technology, it's not the technology, it's the way you use it because uh, you can use technology in a very stupid and linear way. But if you use it to create a space for dialogue, which was the case, um, it's fantastic. I'm really excited. Hmm. Maybe it's my age. I'm slightly more ambivalent, Lara. I was at the conference of uh, the Transformative Learning Association in New York two or three years ago, and uh, it was the opening session. And I'm, I suppose I'm attuned to the idea that 
we should all be respectful one to another and we should think about where we are and the place and what it represents and what it may speak to us and for me it was speaking quite a lot and this is where John Dewey was this is a teachers college in, in, in New York and and then I noticed everybody on their cell phones and and this was going on frantically and I thought what on earth you know this is the opening session we're trying to get to know each other to look around the room and all these and so I, I made a comment um, and this is my no doubt profound ignorance and I said well I think it's important when you start a conference for us to you know have a look around and realize who's here and get a sense of um, what people are bringing with them by way of ideas and background and all the rest of it and someone said to me yeah that's fine Lyndon, but but actually I'm I'm trying to bring somebody else in who can't be here and I'm explaining to them what what's happening so I want to use this in the name of inclusion so I mean yeah I mean maybe this swings and roundabouts here I I, I I don't know I think in 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 some of our countries technology is also a, a, to repeat a bit of a fetish it's going to solve the problems of everything if we have the right technology in the classroom people will learn more efficiently and or if we have the right technology in relation to the crisis of the environment you know we'll solve our problems I, I'm afraid I don't buy into that at all um, I think this is something about, it's an avoidance. It's fetishistic. It's not yeah, actually engaging with some of the difficulties. We need not to be moralistic. I do, I am doing research on sharenting, on the behavior online of parents who share images or stories about their children. And uh, at the start, uh, the attitude, my attitude and my PhD student attitude was very moralistic. You shouldn't do that. Parents who go online all the time, speaking of children, what's, what does it mean? But then we saw that in different spaces, the behavior of these parents is very different. Mm. So we started to analyze the conversations and in some of the chats, not on, in all of the spaces, but in those spaces where there is a sort of interaction that is more dialogical and maybe some people who are there, they are reflexive. So there are questions and the parents, in some cases, they start to think and they even uh, have disorientating dilemmas. We are going to find the disorientating dilemmas. It's very interesting because it becomes for these, these parents who are alone, they don't have, uh, you know, parents today are very alone. And they go online and they find someone on the other part of the world putting a question that creates a dilemma. And the dilemma becomes something that they reason on it and they talk about it online. So, Linden, I, I am positive about this because for that mother, maybe this is the only occasion to talk about a problem that she has. Mm. She becomes reflexive. Of course, you cannot generalize. You cannot say that uh, the socials are always this. But there are spaces. And if you take care, you can imagine adult educators to create these spaces and mentor these mm. adults and create the good conversations. Tony did it in presence. Another person now can do it online. I mm. think it's not impossible. We have to, to, have, to be creative. I think I'm a learner, again, to repeat right from the beginning. Yeah. I, don't, I don't actually know some of this. Um, I'm, I'm open to experience and open to the kind of dialogue um, that, that we are having. I just, when I say that, I feel in my body, Lara, a certain set of anxieties about what's going on. And um, maybe I, I need to work through that I, I, to some extent. And I have things to learn about technology and what it can what it can give at the moment i'm just in a dark space with it i guess yeah and and i'm reading what uh, people are, are writing don't forget that technology allows to many people yep. to have access to education so sometimes it's not good quality education but sometimes it is and as becky says 
uh, having some, at least some meetings in presence is very important because the body speaks and being there in the same room, smelling the same, yes. <laughs> same smells. That is, that is still, for me, is very important. That's why I use blended learning. Blended for me means uh, two thirds uh, in the classroom and one third outside. For the moment, this is uh, my rate of, uh, of it. But I can imagine that if you have a good relationship with a, a group, you can meet them at a distance for, uh, for hours yeah. and, uh, because you already know them. Mm. They trust you, you trust them, they know that they are recognized. And this leaves yeah. space for other things. It uh, creates uh, a larger network. We are talking uh, with people on the other part, in the other part of the ocean, you know. What mm. the technology is fantastic. It can be used to be active and to spread the good news. <laughs> so I think that we, we, we should use technology more uh, on the contrary and not leave it to the ones who do um, the marketing or to do, do who create power situations or uh, hate speech. And yeah. so th this is the place where we need to be technology. And I we see some of the discussion we're having, Laura, is there in the, in the chat, the group chat as well. Yeah. Um, yes, I am reading. Shaking the social structure from the bottom. Of course, it works the opposite way. Sometimes it keeps the social structure and everyone to order um, it keeps everything rigid and people shouting or talking only unto themselves. So in that sense, it's not a very good expression of the kind of dialogical spirit that yeah. we think somewhere is central to um, building a, 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 a more democratic society, a more socially just society. But I can see that, yeah, it can make a, a contribution as well. People can be challenged and shaken. Voices yeah. can come in that otherwise wouldn't be heard. Yeah, yeah. So we have to, a lot to do. <laughs> we didn't talk in this uh, webinar about uh, the research that we are doing because uh, the idea was to talk about the book. And this book is um, uh, a sort of uh, wide reflection on the different mm. perspectives on uh, transformation and transformative learning. Shall we go to the to the um, book list and then possibly if people want to make contact with us directly? Ah, yes, yes. I think we've got um, our this, emails. Here we have some references, so you will have it on uh, online and mm. you can take these references. Of course, in the book there are many more. And then our contacts. And please, if any of you wants to contact us, you can, you can. Well, Have you got them on the, the last slide? Yeah. There we go. Yes, in the last slide. So you can write to us, to us and be aware that Lyndon and I, with, together with Alan Bainbridge, every year in the end of February, start of March, we have a conference in different parts of Europe. So if you are curious about uh, about our uh, things, you can come and visit us. We would be very happy. Yeah. We'd like to thank Lyndon and Laura for this great um, webinar. You guys did a great job and we appreciate everyone attending. Um, as you can see, we have their contact information if you'd like to reach out to them directly. And we will have the video of this available in about 48 hours. And we can send everyone an email and let you know when it's available. We thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, all of thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, you. for hosting us. Thank you, Yana and, and Terry. You. I hope to see you soon. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.